One of the biggest drivers of aging is muscle loss. The muscle gets replaced by fat. And if you actually have muscle, it's like a ribeye steak instead of a filet mignon. I'm gonna key up the first one on high homocysteine levels from Danielle in the community. Hi, Dr. Hyman. I have a quick question. My homocysteine level is consistently high. Right now it's at a 4.7. I am gluten-free and I'm a vegan. Please help me. Any suggestions would be wonderful. So, uh, high homocysteine, what the heck is that? You've probably never heard of it. it <laughs> your body has thousands and thousands of molecules, millions, literally, of compounds that are running around your body. One of the most important ones is called homocysteine. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is, essentially it's a measure of how your body is handling the B vitamins. So, if you are deficient in certain B vitamins, like B6, folate, and B12, it can actually be high. And that's a problem because high homocysteine is in itself, you know, maybe causing more oxidative stress or more inflammation or more other problems like heart disease, dementia, cancer, uh, depression. But it, it actually is a cause by a number of different things that we can actually address clinically. And so, so when I see someone with a high homocysteine, I'm concerned because it, it means that they might be at risk for heart disease, cancer, dementia, depression, and many other things, birth defects, for example. And, and I, you know, just how do we sort of learn all about this? And how do we sort of start to figure out about this? Well, there's a guy named Kilmer McCulley who's written n numerous scientific papers on this, a number of books about this, and was, was the first person to really introduce the idea that this could be a problem. And there's a, there's a severe genetic disorder called hyperhomocysteinemia, which is an extreme version of it. And in this extreme version, kids who are 10 years old will get heart attacks and strokes because their body can't process uh, the, the homocysteine properly and they end up in a lot of trouble. So, so most people don't have that, but about 20 to 35% of people have some variations in their genes that make them need extra folate or a special kind of folate or extra B12 or B6 and special forms of those nutrients. And so I very, very consistently look at this and the data is a bit confusing because I think if you look at the science, it's not clear, not everybody agrees about how big of an issue is for heart disease or this or that. But, but pretty much everybody agrees that it should be in the optimal range. Now, if your level, for example, is over 14, your risk of dementia is 50% higher. Now that's a pretty big risk. And the question is, what is it? How does it work? It, it really is important because it, it regulates one of the most important biochemical processes in your body. We call it methylation. Now, it's a big mouthful, but essentially what it means is there's a, is this chemical compound called methyl groups, carbon and three hydrogens called CH3. And think about this like the, the uh, currency of your body, like like dollars. Like we, we, we use dollars to spend and buy things in exchange currency in the, in the in the in the economy and in the body these methyl groups are constantly being exchanged for all these biochemical processes including our dna regulation <laughs> and, our, and we heard about epigenetics and we've heard about the idea that we can actually regulate our epigenome through doing lifestyle changes through diet and all of the epigenomes function in large part is determined by these methylation patterns and uh, we call it DNA methylation. And in the longevity test that we can look at and tell us, for example, I'm 62, but I did my DNA methylation patterns. I'm 43 according to my DNA epigenome, which is kind of cool. So it, it has played a huge role in a lot of different diseases. Now, if it's, if, if, if it's high, you, you need to kind of figure out why. Do you have the genetic problems? And I pretty much test most of my people who have hemocysteine looking at a number of different genes and, and we do and there's many methylation genes. One of the main ones is called MTHFR. There's also ones called CBS or MTR. And, and they all regulate different enzymes. So basically what happens in your body is that you have to convert one chemical to another chemical. And those, those processes happen through uh, an enzyme or a catalyst that converts one molecule to another. And these catalysts depend on the right nutrients. These, all the cofactors, all the helpers for the enzymes or vitamins and minerals. And so the B vitamins, B6, folate, and B12, are critical for regulating all these methylation pathways. And if they're, if they're insufficient for you, and I mean for you because some people might need 400 micrograms of folate, 
Some people might need four milligrams or 10 times that amount of folate to regulate the same enzyme because they have a functional difference. I'm not going to call it a defect. That's just a difference. We're all very, we all have these variations in our genes that, that require us to have different amounts of different nutrients. In fact, one third of our entire DNA codes for enzymes. And all those enzymes need helpers and vitamins and minerals. And there's variability in the function of those enzymes that requires you to have high, higher amounts of certain of these nutrients. So let's get back to the homocysteine question. So if you have a high homocysteine, it means you might have one of these genetic problems. You might need more B6, folate, B12. And I look at a whole complex of genes when I test people, not just one or two. And you can go to 23andMe and do that. And they'll actually give you all your methylation genes. You can actually upload it to this thing called Genetic Genie and see what your, what your methylation patterns are and whether you have these problems. So you, there's a lot of kind of cool ways you can kind of figure it out yourself. And I'll just tell you a quick story of a, of a patient of mine. I know very, some very cool patients had issues with this. One, one of them was a woman who helped with the movie Fed Up. And she was struggling for years to try to get pregnant and have a baby. And she was the director of the movie. And she ended up having miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage. And then she finally got pregnant and delivered a baby with no brain. We call it anencephaly. It's pretty awful. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the work around this was discovered in China. And I, I actually heard a lecture when I lived in China because in Harbin, which is the northern part of China, it's cold in the winter. It's like north of Beijing. It's kind of near Siberia, basically. <laughs> and and they don't grow a lot of vegetables in the winter there. They don't have hot, they don't have hot houses back then. They don't have like, I mean, uh, you know, like greenhouses. And so, so basically in the winter, they don't have vegetables. Now in China, everybody gets married when? Chinese New Year. When is that? February. When is that? In the middle of winter, when there's no green vegetables. And where does folate come from? Foliage. The word folate comes from the word foliage or greens, essentially. So they don't eat greens at all winter. And what they found was there's a really high rate of birth defects we call spina bifida, which is a defect in the spinal column. It's so important in, in so many regulating in regulating so many things, including the development of the, the spinal cord in a baby. And that's why all prenatal vitamins have uh, extra folate, but they have to have the right kind of folate. So they basically discovered that there was this link between the B vitamins and these birth defects. Now she had this problem of having these miscarriages, which is was caused by this gene she had, we call MTHFR. I'm not gonna give you the chemical name, but it's kind of a big thing, but it's MTHFR. And it's an, a gene that regulates an enzyme that you need to actually convert uh, the folate that you eat from food into the right form of the folate that your body can use. Well, it turns out she had this gene and she read one of my articles and she then ended up taking it to her doctor and said, hey, can you please test me for this? And she definitely had this gene. He said, well, just take folate. And she's like, no, no, Dr. Hyman said in this article, I have to take this special form of folate called methylfolate. Well, he's, I don't know about that, but she did it anyway. And then when I met her, she literally had this, we, we were going around New York City doing PR for the movie, and she had a perfectly formed, beautiful little 10-month-old baby that occurred only because she actually found out about this and took the right vitamin that was based on this methylation pattern, and she had this high homocysteine. So it's that powerful. And another person who had dementia, and same thing, they, they weren't able to actually do the proper methylation, end up with dementia, and I gave them the right B vitamins, and their dementia went away. Uh, another guy I met who was like 50 years old, who had everybody in his family died of heart attacks in their 50s, and he was terrified. And I checked, and he had a super high homocysteine, and he ended up having this gene as well. And so we treated him with the right kind of folate. Now, what are the things that affect this methylation process? Genetics we talked about, and there's tests like 23andMe you can do. I use in my uh, practice something called DNA Health from Nordic Labs, which is a thing that doctors can order. A uh, diet plays a huge role, right? If you're not eating enough greens, <laughs> you're not getting enough folate. If you're not eating the fruits and vegetables, greens and beans and fruit, you're not getting B6, B12, and folate, but also it comes from, I mean, by the way, the, the best source of all these nutrients is liver. <laughs> and I was a kid, we were very poor. We lived in Queens in New York and, and we used to eat chicken livers and onions and rice for dinner. I thought it was a gourmet meal, but it was because we were poor than <laughs> anything else. But actually it really is one of the most nutritionally dense foods on the planet. So egg yolks, meat, liver, oily fish, lots of source of B12, um, foliage, folate, 
So you want to make sure you have plenty of these foods in your diet. Uh, there's also things that can cause too high homocysteine, like sugar, too much processed fats, coffee, alcohol is a big one, uh, kidney failure also. And, and a lot of our food is irradiated. That can deplete the nutrients in the food. So let me be lower in B vitamins. Smoking, if you're a smoker, really messes up your methylation, high homocysteine. If you have gut issues, you might absorb these nutrients. Like if you have Crohn's disease or if you have a leaky gut or damaged gut, you might not absorb these nutrients like B12 in particular. If you're older, you might have low stomach acid and you can't absorb B12. If you are like, I don't know, the Brazilian Americans taking acid blocking drugs like Pepsid and Prevacid and Prilosec and I mean, uh, and, and, and these drugs, they block stomach acid, which you need to absorb B12. So that can be an issue. And also uh, certain medications, uh, in addition to these acid blockers, like methotrexate, which they use for cancer, autoimmune diseases, the birth control pill, B6 deficiency, high blood pressure pills like diuretics, uh, like hydrochlorothiazide, dilantin, which is used for seizures, all affect these B vitamins. And then if you have kidney failure, like I said, thyroid issues, cancer, pregnancy, all these things, and toxins also. So really, there's a lot of reasons it can get screwed up. So how do you check if you're doing okay? Well, check your blood count. You know, you can check your blood count and see if you have a high level of uh, something called MCV. That means your red blood cells are too big. And if they're too big, it may mean you have a full liter B12 deficiency. And that's an easy, cheap test. Homocysteine you can check, obviously. The level should be six to eight. And most labs say, you know, 14 or less is normal. No, that is not normal. That's not optimal. That's the range of the population, but that doesn't mean that we have a healthy population. If you were a Martian and you landed in America in 2022, you'd go, 75% of us are overweight. It's normal to be overweight. It's definitely not normal to be overweight. Uh, You can look at urinary levels of methylonic acid or blood levels, certain amino acids, but it's really important to optimize your, your methylation process. So dark leafy greens, now things like bok choy, um, Swiss chard, kale, watercress, spinach, dandelion, mustard, collard greens, beet greens, also really great. Um, get the B vitamins. We talked about seeds like uh, sunflower seeds, fish and eggs, uh, beans and walnuts, dark re- greens, almonds, um, and so forth. Uh, avoid processed food, canned food, which is depleted B vitamins. Avoid caffeine, alcohol. Don't smoke, obviously. If you're taking medications, be careful with those medications and make sure you're getting enough of the vitamins. For example, if you take these acid blocking medications, and you take B12, it's not going to work. You need a B12 shot. Your gut plays a big role. Fix your gut. We talk a lot about that in a lot of our podcasts. So those are the ways you can optimize your methylation. And, and this is such an important part of your biology. It's one of the central hubs of all your biology. So I talk about this a lot. I work, work with my patients a lot about it. But if you have a high homocysteine, it's for sure concerning and you got to deal with it. All right, Mark, a bunch of follow-up questions off of that. Let's go into the first one. You mentioned you took this test that helps you look at your biological age. I believe it's from a company yeah. called True Diagnostic. We have a link to it inside yeah. of the, the show notes. Uh, no affiliation with them, you know, just a test that you've been doing. And also one of your colleagues and one of my friends, Dr. Kara Fitzgerald, used this test in her study that she published in the Journal of uh, Aging on how actually through following a very similar program that you know you talk about, she was able to reverse people's biological age over the course of eight weeks through lifestyle and dietary interventions. So the question is, if somebody came back and they were shocked by their score, maybe they're 40 and their true biological age showed back as being 50, what are some of the things that they could do to start bringing that biological age down? And how does some of those recommendations play into your answer of the last question. Well, funny you should ask you, because I just finished writing a book on it called Young Forever, where I basically answered that question about how do we reverse our biological age. And, and just a little background on the, on the whole concept. There's a guy named Stephen Horvath, who's a scientist, who, who looked at the epigenome. Now, the genome is your genes. You can't control your genes. You got them from your mother and father, and they're fixed. Uh, maybe soon we'll be able to edit out our genes and use CRISPR and gene editing tools, which is coming down the pike. But for now, it's not really available. But what is available is the epigenome manipulation. Now, the epigenome is like the piano player. Now, on a piano, you got 88 keys, that's it. But think about what you can do on a piano. You can have Mozart, you can have the Grateful Dead, you can have jazz, you can have ragtime, right? You can have folk music. It's like that. The epigenome is a piano player. And the epigenome is controlled by everything that you do. We call the exposome, everything that you're exposed to in your life, your thoughts, your feelings, your diet, exercise, stress, sleep, environmental toxins, your relationships, 
everything affects your epigenome. So you have massive control over that by the quality of your life and your lifestyle and by doing the things that actually help to improve it. And you mentioned Kara Fitzgerald. She didn't use really anything except a very aggressive, and I call it aggressive. It's not really aggressive. It's what I eat all the time. But it's an aggressive dietary intervention, which isn't just the Mediterranean diet, which is great, but it's like an up, upregulated version of that based on functional medicine. It's a very powerful anti-inflammatory diet, but also specifically included foods, a lot of foods, which are designed to improve methylation, improve this process we've been talking about for a while and this podcast. So so basically in the study, what they do is they focus mostly on diet. They had a few other lifestyle interventions they did, which helped like stress reduction and exercise and so forth, but it was mostly diet. And what they found was that in eight weeks, they were able to reverse their biological age by three years, which is mind blowing when you think about that. And imagine we did that for a year. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, would you would you get, you know, with A fifty two divided by eight, I'm terrible at math. But anyway, you get the idea. It's a lot of a lot of age reversal. Now you probably you know it's a limit to it, but it's really impressive to see what you can do when you actually upregulate this process of of proper DNA methylation. So so that's what's kind of exciting. And and in in the in the book that I wrote, Young Forever, it's really about how do you like work on your biological age, not just through diet, but through exercise, through meditation, through eating a phytochemical rich diet, through various uh, supplements and compounds that we can now take like NMN or NAD. So it's really, there's really a lot of strategies, even hormesis, which is this whole idea that what little stresses that we can take on our system that don't kill us, make us stronger, whether it's exercise or hot and cold therapy or hypoxia or hyperthermia or whatever, we kind of are coming up with that can stress the system a little bit. I mean, I, I, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is another kind of stress where you put yourself under pressure with a lot of oxygen in a tank. And they actually dramatically increase telomere length, which is a measure of your biological age. They actually killed a lot of the zombie cells, or we call senescent cells, which increase inflammation in the body. So they're able to like kill zombie cells and increase telomeres almost more than any other intervention. And that's just by applying oxygen under pressure under a high pressure, like uh, two atmospheres of pressure. So there's a lot of really cool technologies out there that we now are learning about that can help us reverse our biological age. That's fantastic. You also mentioned, uh, you know, looking at your DNA and getting an understanding of it. There are friends of yours that uh, Nordic Labs that basically took your DNA analysis and, uh, you know, we are friends with them and we've done some fun projects. You know, they're not a sponsor of this podcast. You just mentioned it. So I thought we'd uh, link it up in the show notes below. They go through your genetic test and talk about the insights that you took away from it. So they made a whole little video and put it on a website. So we'll link to it below. If anybody's curious about that test and what some of the insights you got, you can check that out in the show notes. We'll make sure to link to it. Um, Mark, uh, something that I want to get your um insights on that's also, again, you know, surprise, surprise on the topic of longevity is this idea of grip strength, right? Why is it that grip strength do you think has been so associated with, uh, you know, being as, as far as I understand, one of the top, if not the number one marker of somebody's uh, lifespan here on, on earth. So what is it about grip strength? Well, I think grip strength is just an indirect marker, marker of your overall muscle mass and strength, right? So if your grip strength is weak, uh, it's a sign that you have sarcopenia, which is muscle loss, and that you can't you know, do the things that you might do, whether it's open a jar or just the basic activities of daily life. So one of the biggest drivers of aging is muscle loss. And it's not really talked about it. We don't really learn much about it in medical school. We don't learn what to do about it. We say, oh, exercise and you know, eat, eat well, but it, it, it's such a profound science when you look at what happens as you start to lose muscle. So grip strength is sort of an indicator of your overall level of strength and sarcopenia. And if you have sarcopenia, you're kind of screwed because it's not just that you get weak muscles, but, you know, muscle is the currency of aging. If you don't have muscle, you're going to age fast. Why? Because muscle gets replaced by fat. And if you actually have muscle, it's like a ribeye steak instead of a filet mignon. And you don't want that. I mean, you might want to eat a ribeye steak, but you certainly don't want it for your muscle. Why? Because when you are marbleized muscle, you are actually producing lots of damaging compounds. You actually create lots of inflammatory compounds and increased inflammation. And we know that aging is an inflammatory process. 
we call it inflammaging. It also uh, makes you insulin resistant, which we know is one of the key features of aging where you become more resistant to the effects of insulin and diabetic and pre-diabetic. It also increases cortisol and stress hormone levels, which age us and shrinks your brain and makes you demented. And it, it lowers growth hormone, which is necessary for repair and healing. It lowers testosterone, which is necessary for keeping your muscle and for sexual function. So it really creates a whole cascade of problems when you have low muscle mass. And that's sort of, we've had another podcast where we talked about protein and the importance of protein as we get older, because we have to maintain our muscle mass. If we're going to stay healthy as we age, we need muscle mass. And Drew, I don't know if you know this, but the major reason people go into nursing homes is not because they're sick. It's because they can't do their daily activities. They can't tie their shoes. They can't get out of bed. They can't get out of a chair. <laughs> you know, that's because they've lost muscle. And if you are listening to this, I encourage you to sit in a, a chair, like a kitchen chair, and don't touch the chair and keep your back straight and just try to sit up out of your chair without actually bending forward. And if you can't do that, it means you probably have weak muscles and you better get on it. Yeah, it's so true. And, and even if you... And, and unfortunately, in this world that we live in today, it's not like a long, slow decline in this thing where one day you wake up and say, you know what? I'm having a hard time getting up. I'm having a hard time tying my shoes. I think I need to now be in a nursing home. It's usually you're in the kitchen. You've lost so much muscle mass you don't really know. And this activity you used to do, which is getting on top of the stool to put the dishes away at the top of the shelf, you end up slipping and falling and you can't catch yourself because your grip strength isn't good. You don't have enough muscle mass. You fall and you break your hip. And that's how most people end up in these situations. It's very tragic. It's happened to family members of mine before. And it's very unfortunate. And it's a very tough thing. You know, I heard a statistic from uh, one of your colleagues that you introduced me to, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, who was on my podcast recently. And you've done some podcasts with her too. We'll link to those in the show note. She said, for a woman 65 plus who falls from you know, who falls and mm. has like a hip fracture, less than 50% of them will ever end up walking again. That's terrifying. And that should be yeah. terrifying for people who are listening. Well, it's even worse than that, Drew. It's like getting a terminal diagnosis of metastatic cancer in terms of your longevity. <laughs> if you get a hip fracture, your risk of death is as high as that of getting a terminal cancer diagnosis with stage four metastatic cancer. Wow, that's, that's, that's nuts. And I know that there are a lot more, you know, companies and solutions and people that are talking about how do you make working out, strength training, of course, diet. You did our whole last podcast that we did together was about dietary interventions and protein. And I'm just excited to see that to really make this a, a national focus for individuals. You know, it's never too late to start making movement a regular part of your lifestyle. All right, Mark, I want to continue on this topic of longevity, but bringing up and tying back into something that you had mentioned, which is this idea of sexual health. A lot of people notice that as they get older, that their libido starts to go down. That could show up in the form of erectile dysfunction or just actually not craving, you know, wanting, uh, you know, physical intimacy. Of course, intimacy is a spectrum and there's all, this all sorts of different types, but specifically when it comes to our sexual drive, what have you known as a practicing functional medicine doctor about how things like inflammation and our modern lifestyle take a toll and are some of the root causes behind a low sex drive as people age? Well, I mean, this is a complicated subject because it's, 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 it's many aspects to this. There's relational aspects, there's the intimacy aspects, uh, you know, for women, often the biggest sex organ is between their ears. So it's, it's really a, a complicated subject. And it's, it's all about the relationships as well as their biology. So I'm going to focus a little bit on the biology for a minute. And, and uh, you know, I know, I know you all this thing might think this is just because I'm focused on sugar and my whole life sort of focused on talking about sugar and insulin resistance as a big factor in everything. But the truth is that sugar is one of the biggest problems with our sexual health. And what are you talking about, Dr. Hyman? Well, when, especially for men, uh, and when, and women, it's a little bit different, but for men, what happens is that as you increase your sugar and starch intake, you develop what we call belly fat, visceral fat, that organ fat, or you get the little poochy stomach, or maybe you got a big stomach. And that causes the production of huge amounts of inflammation, as we talked about, but it also increases um, something called aromatase, <laughs> which actually converts estrogen, uh, testosterone into estrogen. <laughs> so you end up actually having 
uh, high levels of estrogen. And so you become more like a woman, your testosterone levels go down, your estrogen levels go up, and you, and you basically lose desire and lose function. The other thing that happens with insulin resistance is it's the biggest driver of hardening of the arteries. And the small blood vessels are the ones affected often first. And guess where they are? In your penis. So those, you get literally hardening the arteries in the penis and the lack of blood flow affects circulation. And that's why Viagra and those drugs work is because they increase blood flow and circulation by increasing nitric oxide, which dilates the blood vessels, which is not a bad thing. I don't tell a lot of people continue to have healthy sex lives, but the key is figuring out the cause, not just taking Viagra because eventually it won't work. Right. So you've got to focus on the cause. And so a lot of a lot of the times as we age, as we talked about, when you lose muscle, you lower testosterone, when you increase fat in your body, you lower testosterone. In fact, there are a lot of great ways to increase testosterone. Weightlifting uh, is a powerful way to increase testosterone, eating more fat. And by the way, your sex hormones are made from fat. <laughs> and in fact, cholesterol is the building block of testosterone and all the sex hormones. So if you're taking a statin, for example, it can really lower testosterone and sex function. So you've got to look at the whole picture of what's going on with that person. And of course, there are other complications that might affect their health, like thyroid function certainly affects libido and sex drive. And um, your your testosterone, as we mentioned. And, and so you kind of got to look at the whole picture of what's happening with somebody. But I, I think for most, most of the people I see, it has to do with this problem of insulin resistance, which affects almost nine of the 10 Americans. And for women, it's a little bit different. You know, they go through menopause and their hormones change. They're, they may have vaginal dryness, which may affect their desire and, and function and cause pain. But many, many women postmenopausal continue to have really healthy sex lives. Uh, and sometimes they need a little help. They might need a little vaginal estrogen. They might need a little testosterone to help them with libido. But by working with people's lifestyle and diet and, and, and lowering the starch and sugar, increasing the good fats, doing strength training, kind of tweaking some of the hormonal things, often people can really regain uh, sex function once it's lost, or actually uh, just continue to have healthy sex life well into their 60s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s. And I've seen people older. I mean, surprising. I had a woman come to me who's 88 years old. She's like, I'm in a new relationship. Can you help me out here? And I'm like, sure. And we got her. We got her going again. So you know, I think I think you know, we just have these weird ideas in our culture about sexuality and aging. But you can continue to have a healthy sex life well into your late life. Well, you know, there's something important that you said that a lot of functional medicine doctors talk about is that actually for men, erectile dysfunction is one of the first indicators of cardiovascular issues that are going on in the body. It's like a leading indicator, yeah. the canary in the coal mine. Absolutely. I mean, so exactly. So if you're having trouble there, uh, it's good to look at your heart for sure. All right, Mark, we're going to go into our next question here from Jules in our community. And she's asking about PCOS. I'm just curious if you have any recommendations for someone who's been diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. I am interested in learning about what diet you recommend as well as exercises you feel would be beneficial. So Drew, you know, PCOS is a, stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. And when I was in medical school, we learned about an obstetrics and gynecology. <laughs> the truth is it's not a gynecological problem. It's a nutritional problem. And what happens is that women who have high levels of starch and sugar in their diet and have some genetic predisposition to insulin resistance, prediabetes, which is pretty much almost everybody except for a few lucky people. I mean, if you're basically uh, someone who tends to gain belly fat when you eat starch and sugar, and I, and by the way, all of us can force ourselves to be like that. When I when I you know I went to Italy a few years ago and I kind of went on a binge. I'm like I'm the hell with it. I'm just going to eat bread and pasta and pizza and drink wine. And I got a little tummy. So even you know even I can get that if I if I'm not careful. But it's it's pretty common, and it and it basically happens when you when you eat a lot of starch and sugar, you get high levels of insulin, and that affects your hormones in a really adverse way. So women tend to get high levels of estrogen, they get uh, anovulatory cycles, meaning they don't ovulate and make progesterone. So their estrogen progesterone ratio gets way up. They have heavy periods. They get acne, uh, which is from more testosterone. And they get hair loss on their head. So you'll see women with like kind of balding in the head on the top. You'll see them, they'll have a beard, literally the bearded woman syndrome. They'll get facial hair. 
That's all we call polycystic ovarian syndrome, at least infertility and all kinds of problems for women. So it is really a primarily a nutritional problem. And unfortunately, it's treated by the birth control pill, by giving women all kinds of weird hormonal shots. Uh, and, and most of the time, it can be treated usually uh, in nutritional therapies. And, and that means a diet that's lower in starch and sugar, higher in fat, good fats like olive oil, avocados, nuts and seeds, and so forth. And by by really eliminating all that kind of processed junk that we eat that's causing this epidemic of insulin resistance. There's also some really interesting data on, on certain like uh, kind of forms of B vitamins. One of them is inositol, uh, which might, people might not have heard about, but it is in, you know, it's in a B complex usually. And a particular form of it called d chiro inositol, which has been used in research and is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So it's not like some alternative medical journal. This is the top medical journal in the world. If you're American, if you're British, it's the Lancet, and they have a you know, fight about that. But basically, it's a top medical journal showing that giving this nutritional compound can help uh, regulate insulin. And, and w- when I work with pa- patients in my practice, I use the same approach I do with someone who's got diabetes, for example. A ketogenic diets can be helpful. Fixing people's gut can be helpful. A lot of the uh, hormones uh, are regulated through the gut. And we know, for example, that if you have a bad microbiome, you can produce more for example, clostridia, which is a, a bacteria that can increase estrogen levels and cause some of this estrogen progesterone imbalance. So, it, you know, it, it's a horrible problem for women to have. It's really common. Uh, it, it's not always the women who are obese or overweight. Sometimes women who are who are not can have this. So it, it's not always uh, entirely because people are eating junk food and sugar, but most of the time it is, and, and it can be really well addressed. Um, I, I, you know, many women, for example, have been resistant to getting pregnant and have infertility. And Dr. Walter Willett, who's one of the most uh, revered nutrition scientists in the world at Harvard School of Public Health, had, wrote a book called The Fertility Diet, which was all about this issue of insulin resistance and infertility and polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is super common. So I, I you know, I think it's really honestly poorly treated by obstetricians and gynecologists. <laughs> I was talking to somebody recently and they were like, you know, my internist was like uh, saying really, really how shocked they were to realize how much food played a role in chronic disease. I'm like, oh my God, finally people are getting it. You know, it's like, uh, and I see more and more uh, conventional doctors getting the idea that nutrition should play a role uh, in our in our medical school curriculums and should be part of our, our therapeutic practice. So it's kind of coming. I've been, you know, pushing the rock uphill for the last 30 years. I think finally we might be on the downhill side. And and then getting getting more common, but but it is it is a really treatable condition. It's, it creates a lot of misery for a lot of women. But but I would encourage people to think about really looking at at ways they can handle it through diet and lifestyle, and then certain supplements and nutrients play a big role. All right, Mark. Our next question comes from the Hi Ho app, and this is Tammy who has a question about osteoporosis. Looking for your suggestions for. A- Osteoporosis in a woman who is in her 60s. I was told hormones is too late for hormones, and I don't want to take the drugs. So, would love to hear what you have to say. Thanks. You know, osteoporosis is really a common problem, and as so we chatted about earlier, one of the challenges is if your bones get thin and weak, and you fall and break a bone, particularly a hip, as you get older, it's like getting a terminal cancer diagnosis in terms of your risk of death. So it's it's really quite shocking. I think 50% of people who get a hip fracture die within a year. So that, that's not great. So you really don't want to get osteoporosis. And historically, you know, we really didn't have a lot of it because most of us were out there working hard, using our bodies and eating a very nutrient-dense diet. And, and unfortunately, the, the dogma has been that if you want to prevent osteoporosis, you have to drink a lot of milk and take a lot of calcium. Unfortunately, that's not true. <laughs> and the got milk ads were taken off the air and out of magazines because the, uh, the FCC, the, uh, the Federal Trade Commission, which regulates truth in advertising, said there's no data. You have to stop advertising. And by the way, these ads were part of a campaign that's a government-sponsored program called the Checkoff Program, which partners with industry to help go do research on various nutritional and agricultural products. Uh, but unfortunately, it's used to actually promote products. It was a, co- a kind of a government-sponsored program with the Dairy Council that put these ads out without a lot of data. 
Now, you don't take my word for it. You, you simply need to Google milk and health. And Walter Willett and David Ludwig are the authors, Harvard researchers, who reviewed all the science and published it in the New England Journal of Medicine, again, the top medical journal in the world, showing that not only was milk not good for your health, not only was milk not good for fractures, but your risk of fracture went up by 9% for every glass of milk you had. So it's actually the opposite. Also, calcium supplements, not so great either. And it's not about the calcium you're eating, it's the calcium you're losing. So if, if you look at what really makes the most difference for bones, it's vitamin D. And if there's one thing I, I would say to you is make sure your vitamin D levels are 50 to 75. That is so important. And I say what your vitamin D levels are, not what vitamin D amount you should take because it's different for everybody. Some people might get there with 1,000 units of vitamin D. Some people might get there with 5,000 or maybe 10,000 based on their genetics or their absorption or various issues. So don't think that milk's going to help you, number one. Take vitamin D, number two. And, and number three, understand that, that it, you, know, you need to have not only the right nutrients in your diet, but you need to exercise. And, and before I get into the exercise piece, I just kind of want to come back to this calcium issue. You know, if you look at you look at calcium intakes, for example, in Africa, I mean, they might have three, 400 milligrams of net calcium intake a day, but they actually have very, very strong bones. Now, the, if you look at American intake, they're saying take 1,500 milligrams of vitamin D, of, sorry, of calcium a day. Well, it, it doesn't matter how much you're taking in, it matters how much you're losing. And we have a calcium losing environment. What do I mean by that? Well, if you have sugar, if you have caffeine, if you have alcohol, if you have soda, it's the worst, like, like the colas particularly have phosphoric acid in them. That causes you to lose tremendous amount of calcium. If we eat an acidic diet, which is processed food and, and sugar and so forth, that acidity causes you to lose calcium. So you're basically peeing out your bones, literally peeing out your bones in your urine. And we actually can do a test to measure this. I can, I do this with women who come to see me with osteoporosis. I measure their urine levels of certain markers that tell me that their bones are dissolving and are coming out in their urine. So it's really, really important to not look at the total calcium intake, but the net calcium retention. So you could be, for example, taking in 300 milligrams of calcium and losing 200. That means you're up 100. If you're taking in 1500 and you're losing 1700, you're down 200. So it really matters what your net calcium Absorption versus your net calcium losses. And that, and then all those things I mentioned are the things that cause calcium loss. And there's, there's lots more. So really important to look at, at your diet as a key factor and making sure you're eating a nutrient dense diet, making sure you're not doing the things that cause you to lose calcium and make sure you're taking adequate vitamin D. Now you say, well, why don't we eat vitamin D? Because, you know, hunter gatherers never had vitamin D and they didn't have bad bones and, why don't I take vitamin D? Well, sure. If you want to go around in a loincloth naked outdoors most of the time, you know, hunting and gathering and getting sun exposure on your whole body, go ahead. Or if you're going to be living in a coastal area, if you're eating only wild, wild fatty fish all the time with lots of vitamin D, okay. If you're hunting and gathering and eating like tons of wild mushrooms, you're probably okay. But most of us don't do that. So most of us live and work inside and we need plenty of vitamin D and we can get it through vitamin D supplements. I, I, unfortunately, we have, I think we have to take them. It's one of the most important things we need, need to do. It also helps so many other things like immune function and, and COVID prevention and many other things. I mean, in fact, one study I think was from Israel, they found out their, their vitamin D levels were over 50, there was zero deaths from COVID. So it's a really critically important nutrient. So you can you kind of kind of have to make sure you're, you're not actually losing calcium, that you're actually getting vitamin D and that you're then exercising. So you can do all the right things, but if you actually are not uh, exercising, it's like putting all the ingredients for soup in a pot on the stove, but not turning on the heat, right? You're not going to make soup. It's just going to bunch of ingredients in the soup with no, with, I mean, in the pot with no soup. So you have to turn on the heat and that's exercise. And I've, I've seen women, even at 70 years old, take uh, seriously exercise. One of them did started like a vinyasa yoga practice, like a power yoga practice, she increased her bone density by 10%, which is more than any of the drugs you'll see. Now, you mentioned you don't want to be on hormones. It's too late to take hormones. Well, that's not true. You can sometimes use hormone therapy like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. And by the way, testosterone is a great bone builder. And a lot of women have low testosterone. And women can actually take testosterone. Women have testosterone. Men have estrogen. It's, it's not like it's, it's sort of 
a binary thing. It's just that women have tend to have more estrogen, obviously, and men have more testosterone, but you have to have the right balance for, for your sex. So you can, through a, a number of lifestyle factors, really, really improve your bone density at any age. Now, there are certain things that really tend to cause osteoporosis that are concerning that may be not thought of, like, for example, leaky gut and gluten. Gluten is a huge factor because it causes all kinds of problems in the gut, absorption, and a lot of osteoporosis risk comes from gluten issues, which, by the way, may affect up to 20% of the population in some level of gluten sensitivity, or or we call it non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Like 1% has true celiac, and that they're really at risk, but even the non-celiac gluten sensitivity people have an issue. So, you know, uh, you want to make sure you're really taking your bone health seriously, and that's why, you know, I've really doubled down on my exercise and strength training and I really focused on it. And I really, I made sure that I, I really take adequate vitamin D and exercise and my bone density, it keeps increasing, which is amazing. So even as I get older, I get better. Osteoporosis is a condition that you don't want to have. You yeah. want to preempt it. You want yeah. you want to get the horse out of the barn. By the time well, you have that's osteoporosis. The thing. I mean, it's, 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 it's really the thing that often is killing people because if you're old and frail, you, you fall, you break your hip. And and you end up with a blood clot and you get pneumonia and it's 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 really a killer. And yeah. life expectancy yeah. a year after a hip fracture is dismal. It's yeah. like worse than cancer. It's like fifty percent life expectancy. Yep. So it's no joke. And you know, there's about ten million Americans that have, older Americans that have osteoporosis and about forty three that have osteopenia or low bone mass. So that's like fifty three million Americans who are headed for disaster. Yeah. And it's one of those things that most doctors don't check. They don't really think about until the horse is out of the barn and you've already broken a hip or you've already got osteopenia or osteoporosis. And it often can start early. Yeah. So yeah. why are we seeing this incredible rate of osteoporosis? Because, you know, we as a society drink so much milk and have so much <laughs> calcium and we should, we're told to take calcium, but <laughs> what is going on? Why are we seeing these incredible rates of osteoporosis? Yeah, but, well, that, you bring up a really good point, which is that <laughs> most most patients and most doctors think, oh, I just need more calcium for osteoporosis. I need to drink more milk for my osteoporosis. And I'll never forget it when I was uh, in my primary care practice, uh, I had a patient who was an older woman who had severe kyphosis. So she was, you know, had the hunchback. Yeah. And guess what her, guess what she did for a living? She was a farmer and her family uh, had dairy a, a farm. dairy farm. And she, guess what? She drank milk every day of her life. And she had the most severe case of osteoporosis I've ever seen. It didn't work out so good for her. Exactly. <laughs> right. And and I, th I think as I, as I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, as we were, we were talking is that uh, for every 200 grams of milk that you drink, you have a 9% increased risk for osteoporosis. Okay, so every glass of milk that you have, you increase your risk of osteoporosis by 9%? Yeah. Of a fracture or osteoporosis? Osteoporosis. A fracture, though. Yeah. I mean, I, this is this, this is incredible. I encourage people to check out this brilliant article in the New England Journal of Medicine. You can just go online and Google. It's called Milk and Health by Dr. David Ludwig and Walter Willett. And it really is one of the most well-researched, profound analyses of all the data on milk and whether or not there's any data to support its health benefits. Uh, and, and I do believe it's nature's perfect food, but only if you're a calf. Because <laughs> for humans and adults, it seems to cause a lot of issues, including osteoporosis. So it doesn't decrease fracture risk. So, but that's not the cause of osteoporosis. What are the what are the real causes in our society of osteoporosis? Why are we seeing these high rates? Because it seems like a design flaw. And why why are we seeing such high rates of osteoporosis in this population? Well, I mean, there's there's the the risk factors for osteoporosis. Obviously, as you get older, you will you know you will lose some bone mass. I mean, that's part of the aging process. And I you always want to look at the risk factors. So, women are more prone towards. Uh, is it aging or is it? Is it what we do while we're inflammaging, aging? Inflammaging, inflammaging. Is it is it what we do while we're aging that makes us age faster? Yeah, and then actually it's inflammation. Inflama chronic inflammation is one of the big things that's tied in with uh, osteoporosis. Mm. And uh, there's a term called inflammaging. So as you age, your body can develop more inflammation. So chronic low-grade inflammation, patients who have colitis, patients who have rheumatoid arthritis are at higher risk for osteoporosis. P patients who have heart disease. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. So, so there's there's this phenomena where where we're seeing uh, high rates of osteoporosis, and as I as I dug into it, and I you know one of the things we had to do at Canyon Ranch was we had to give lectures three or four times a week, 
And one of the lectures I gave was on osteoporosis. I got really smart about it. And we also, at Kenya Ranch, it's a lot of preventive screening. And we have to do a lot of DEXA scans. Now, a DEXA scan is a special machine that is a low-dose X-ray. It's like flying across from New York to L.A., that amount of radiation you'd get when you fly in a plane. Very low dose. And it looks at the bone density. So you can see on this very low dose x-ray whether or not you have thin bones or strong bones and where they're weak or where they're thin. And so we treat a lot of patients. But I gave these lectures and started looking, why are we seeing such high rates in this society? And we came up with so many different factors. Our diet, we know that sugar, alcohol, caffeine, caffeine. salt, and even what is consumed in massive quantities is about 10% of our calories, soda, Phosphoric acid in sodas and the colas is incredibly dissolving of your bones. Oh, yeah. Stress makes your bones dissolve. <laughs> and of course, lack of activity. We're all sedentary. Words, yep. And we don't use our bodies. And, and you, you mentioned aging, but if you keep up your muscle mass and if you keep up your activity level, you can maintain your bone ma mass. Yes, yeah. You know, we, we, we often talk of osteopenia or osteoporosis, but we don't talk of sarcopenia, yeah. which is the loss of muscle. And that's what goes along with with bone loss. Yep. So you have all these factors and we're literally, you know, peeing out calcium. Yeah, exactly. In, yeah. Our, in our urine because, uh, you know, in some countries like in Africa, they have like intakes of calcium of two, 300 milligrams a day, but they don't really have osteoporosis. Here we have intakes of a thousand or 1500 milligrams a day and we see high rates of osteoporosis. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. It's not the total calcium, it's the calcium balance. Exactly. It's it's what you're peeing out compared to what you're taking in. So in Africa, they're not doing all these bad things, and they're not losing their bones and their urine. They're not. And we actually have tests where we can measure if you're peeing out your bones. Yeah, exactly. We right. do the, that at, at the Ultra Wellness the Center here. Bone, we measure, resor bone resorption testing. We measure exactly. markers of increased bone turnover because there's this constant dance right between bone buildup and bone breakdown. Right. Exactly. And yep. so we we've got to kind of make sure we're constantly pushing the bone buildup and not so much the bone breakdown. Exactly. Yeah. The the, the osteoclast. I, I, the analogy of it is like somebody building a wall, and uh, osteoclast, which are the cells that break down bone, and then there's the osteoblasts, which the 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 cells that build up bone. And normally our bodies are constantly doing it in a in a balanced way. So there's just as much bone breakdown turnover, and then you rebuild the bone. When you have too much osteoclastic activity, which happens in chronic inflammatory conditions, then what you're doing is you're breaking down more bone than you're building up. Yeah. Uh, and the other important thing, which is also, it's not actually uh, determined by DEXA scanning, is the quality of the bones. Yeah, so tell us about the quality of the bone, because you know you can look at a scan and see it's good or not good, but what if it's more fragile or brittle? Exactly, so you want flexible bones. You want bones that bend. You want bones that are a little more uh, uh, rubbery, if you will. Yeah. Uh, yeah because And there, I, I remember this very well, because when, when I was in my training, one of the things that they used to give for patients with osteoporosis was fluoride. Do you remember you know, yes. using fluoride? And what they found is that, guess what? You did get denser bones with taking fluoride, but guess what? The bones were more brittle. Yeah. So they broke. Yeah. So you want actually healthy quality bones, not just the density, but it's the quality of the bones. And what determines the quality? Uh, the connective tissue that's in the uh, in the in the center of the bones. So it's not just the the calcium. It's the it's the uh, connective cartilage tissue that's in the in the center of the bones uh, that makes it healthy. And that's also this is a, a very simple thing to to remember. Is one of the big things that uh, increases a person's risk for uh, osteoporosis is smoking. Mm -hmm. And I always tell my patients, you know, you ever see somebody who's a, a, a chronic smoker? What do they have? Wrinkles. Okay. They have more wrinkles. Right. Smoking uh, uh, upregulates meta uh, matrix metalloprotease enzymes, which are breakdown collagen. And that's why pa patients who are smokers have higher risk for cardiovascular disease, higher risk for osteoporosis, because they're actually breaking down their connective tissue. Wow. Yeah. That's another reason to stop smoking. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, it's, I, I, actually, one, it's, all, I, it's funny because if you have a, 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 a woman who's a smoker, they oftentimes, if I, I'll, I'll, one of the things I'll tell them is, well, you, you don't want to have wrinkles and they'll stop smoking because, mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. you know, the vanity is thy name is woman. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, you mentioned something I want to come back to, which is this whole idea of inflammation. And we've talked about all kinds of conditions on this podcast and the house call. And the truth is most chronic illnesses are related to inflammation, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, dementia, depression, autoimmune disease, obviously. But osteoporosis just seems a little bizarre to be related to inflammation. How does that work? And, and how, do, how do we identify what the factors are 
that are causing the inflammation that leads to osteoporosis. Well, yeah, and you can. There are measures that you can do to check for sort of low-grade inflammation. Uh, things like uh, HS or high-sensitivity C-reactive protein, uh, glyc A. Um, looking at uh, their diet, so uh, an anti-inflammatory diet uh, helps to decrease inflammation. Uh, looking at essential fatty acids are also important. Looking at whether or not there's any silent gut inflammation. Uh, when you do stool analysis, you can check uh, for markers, which I call like uh, CRPs of the gut, which is calprotectin. So if you have chronic gut, low-grade gut inflammation, that's going to potentially increase your risk for osteoporosis. If you have sort of low-grade osteoarthritis, uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which is more mm. severe than osteoarthritis, uh, it's more of a, a significant joint destructive inflammatory arthritis. Those are things which uh, break down bone very, very slowly. It's a it's yeah. like a slow leak. And our, on our American diet, is our standard American diet, is a very inflammatory diet of yeah. processed food, sugars, refined oils, and lack of protective anti-inflammatory foods, yeah. right? Which are the phytonutrients and plant foods. And, and so we, we, we get this incredibly... Uh, upregulated immune system, which is why we're all suffering from COVID in America. We've had you know, over 11 million cases, over a quarter million deaths to date as this recording, and and I think we're we're uniquely susceptible because we're so inflamed. And, and osteoporosis is one of the uh, the victims of inflammation. Our yep. bones are one of the victims, and and it's from leaky gut. It's from our processed diet. It's from a uh, lack of protective foods. So we, we really have an opportunity to really change that dynamic and shift the balance from bone breakdown to bone buildup, mm -hmm. right? Exactly, Hel healthy healthy bones. Yeah, and you know, how do we how do we normally treat this with traditional medicine? What is what is the general approach in terms of diagnosis and, and treatment? Well, the diagnosis, as we mentioned, is really with DEXA scan. And, and I always l like to emphasize, especially as women tend to have osteoporosis more than men, but men can get osteoporosis, mm -hmm. um, mm. you know, and there are certain medications that can do that. But I, I actually think that one of the ideal things to do is to actually get your bone density checked when you have no symptoms whatsoever. When you're at peak bone mass, which is around 30 to 35 years of age, you want to know what your bones are then. What your baseline is. Right, exactly. Because I, I can't tell you the number of times that I've seen a patient and they're a, a woman, especially a woman, they're entering into uh, the menopause and I ask them, have you had your bone density check, test checked? No. Well, I said, well, you need to actually have that checked. And if you have one when, when you're at peak bone mass, which is around maybe 20, uh, 25 to 30 years old, and then you get one as you're entering menopause or the perimenopausal area, and then you can see, okay, where are your bones going? Where are they going? You have two points. One data point doesn't show you much. Two data points show you a trend of either is going up, going down, staying the same. Very, very important information. Mm -hmm. um, so, so make sure you get your bone density early and at intervals that uh, are depending on what your bone density shows. If you're great at 30, you can probably wait till you're 50. Yeah. But if you're menopause, you want to check more. And men, men, men get osteoporosis too. It's Absolutely, men a, get osteoporosis also. A ladies' also. disease, right? Absolutely. It's not no, exactly anybody can get it. And you know, again, you know, high uh, levels of alcohol, high levels of caffeine, the PPIs, which uh, acid are blockers, acid blockers, big ones. Big, okay, that's big the time. third leading uh, most prescribed drug in the world, and it's an acid blocker. And if you take this like for hypern or reflux, you're going to get osteoporosis because you're inhibiting mineral yep. absorption. Yep. Right. That's like pro. Tonix, Prilosec, Asifex, Nexium, all those drugs. Yeah, chronic steroid use is a big risk factor for osteoporosis, a huge one. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, smoking, and then just sedentary lifestyle. If you're not stretching your bones, you're not, you know, uh, putting uh, um, stress on your bones. There's a, uh, I remember when I was in my training. Use it or lose it, basically. Use it or lose it. And there's a, there's actually a, a, a interesting thing. It's called Wolf's Law, which is that bone responds to stress. And uh, I remember reading this this uh, this article. Looked at uh, astronauts. They were in their you know young you know thirty years old, and they went up into outer space. And guess what? In outer space, you float around. There's no stress on your bones. And when they came down on planet Earth, they actually lost a significant amount of their bone loss, bone mass, because they were not having sort of the body. And it says, oh, you know, we don't need our bones. We're just going to jettison. It's like a, a a balloon where you jettison the ballast, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, you get rid of the bones that you don't need. So our bodies naturally will make stronger, better bones when we res uh, when we respond and uh, use stress, weight, weight resistance exercise, uh, bands, uh, you know, uh, 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 resistance machines, etc is very, very important for maintaining a uh, good bone mass. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Hyman. Thanks for tuning into The Doctor's Pharmacy. I hope you're loving this podcast. It's one of my favorite things to do and introducing you all the experts that I know and I love and that I've learned so much from. And I wanna tell you about something else I'm doing, which is called Mark's Picks. It's my weekly newsletter. And in it, I share my favorite stuff 
from foods to supplements to gadgets to tools to enhance your health. It's all the cool stuff that I use and that my team uses to optimize and enhance our health. And I'd love you to sign up for the weekly newsletter. I'll only send it to you once a week on Fridays. Nothing else, I promise. And all you have to do is go to drhyman.com forward slash picks to sign up. That's drhyman.com forward slash picks, P-I-C-K-S, and sign up for the newsletter. And I'll share with you my favorite stuff that I use to enhance my health and get healthier and better and live younger longer. Now back to this week's episode. And let's get back to the diagnosis part because you know you do a DEXA scan. Let's say you have low bone density. What do you what do you look for next? Because well, there's a lot for... of things that doctors don't often check that we look at here. What what do you think about? What are the what are the most common things that maybe a traditional doctor might look at? And what are the tests that we might do that are quite different? Oh yeah, so so some of the tests that we'll do uh, is the uh, uh, as I mentioned the DEXA scan. Uh, we will then do uh, uh, urinary bone resorption, so we can actually measure the collagen breakdown pro uh, products like n peptides yeah. in the urine. Basically, if you're peeing out your bones, we can you're check that. Exactly. The, when you lose your bones, you pee them out. That's exactly right. You you can uh, do that. Uh, measuring the vitamin D level uh, is very, very important. That's yes. another. Uh, vitamin D helps to regulate calcium and so calcium metabolism. Important. Far more important than calcium. Yeah, way more important than calcium. And then the other thing that's also important is to realize is that you do not want to take too much calcium. And I actually tell my patients, I don't want you actually taking a calcium supplement pr yeah. most of the time. I never I want you it. getting it through your diet. Yes. Exactly. And and if you do take it in a supplement form, you probably don't need, uh, and you don't want to go over probably about 600, 500 yeah. to 600 milligrams. Yeah. And there's studies showing that women who are taking higher doses over a thousand, like 1,200, 1,500 milligrams, they actually get more calcification in their uh, in their arteries too. Yeah, well, that's the calcium is the nat nature's band aid. So wherever there's inflammation, calcium goes. And so when you talk about hardening of the arteries, yes, it's really calcium buildup in the arteries exactly. and plaque. So that's that's not good. So so we and look at we look at vitamin D, we look at the bone density, we look at the bone resorption, we look at um, vitamin K. Vitamin K. Vitamin K is a big a, one. Which is a vitamin made in your gut. And if you don't have a good microbiome, that can be a problem. Exactly. Yeah. So there's there's actually two forms of vitamin K. There's the, there's the vitamin K that you find in plants and the vitamin K that you make from gut bacteria. And um, vitamin K is traditionally thought of as a vitamin which helps with clotting. But vitamin K actually has an effect on bone uh, uh, density. And it's very, very important to get adequate amounts of vitamin K. So you can actually take low levels of vitamin K and that can help with clotting issues, but you need much higher levels of vitamin K to have a bone effect. Yeah. And we do the test here, which is, a, it's a mouthful, but it's called undercarboxylated osteocalcin. <laughs> and it is a biomarker for yeah. a functional vitamin K deficiency. Mm. And I, this is a test I love to do in patients. Yeah, people, because don't, people don't know about it. Doctors don't usually do it. Yeah, yeah. And there's a, right now, there's only one lab that, that actually does it. Uh, but measuring that can tell you whether or not there, you have a functional vitamin K deficiency. And it's, I oftentimes, and actually most of the time, if I'm giving vitamin D, I will give vitamin K at the same time. Mm. Otherwise, yeah. you'll start getting calcium deposition in tissues that you don't want to. That's right. And then there are co other conventional things that often get looked at, like parathyroid hormone. If you parathyroid have a, a tumor on your parathyroid gland, it causes more bone turnover. Yep. If you have certain cancers, like uh, you know blood cancers, but you can look at protein levels in the blood that look at protein uh, can be affecting uh, bone health. And also, you know, people can get weird things like Cushing's or, or adrenal yep. tumors or brain tumors that cause high steroid levels in the body. So there's a lot of things that we look at. Most of those don't turn out to be, it's mostly the age related, just general sedentary life, bad lifestyle habit, osteoporosis. Uh, but we also look here at the Ultra Wellness Center and a lot of other things that give us clues about why you might have a problem. For example, we look at the gut because if you have leaky gut, uh, you could drive inflammation that causes problems. If you have digestive issues and not absorbing minerals, if you're taking an acid blocker, we, we care about that. And also, uh, gluten is a huge cause huge. of osteoporosis. Yeah. <laughs> like People don't realize that. If you have celiac, for sure, but even if you have low-grade non-celiac gluten sensitivity, definitely it, it causes leaky gut, impairs absorption. So there's a lot of things we look at that may be different than what you see at a normal practice. Yeah, it's interesting you, you say you mentioned that because uh, one of the biggest risk factors is having celiac disease because uh, uh, gl gluten uh, uh, issues can affect uh, mineralization. And one, one, of the, one of my take-home uh, things when I do with patients is I often ask them, um, uh, because I come from a, fam a family of dentists, is um, I often ask, you know, uh, how many fillings do you have? Do you have any cavities? Do you have... Uh, weak teeth. Uh, it, it's a very common thing. People, yeah. people say, well, my dentist said I have weak enamel. 
well, why do you have weak enamel? Well, guess what? Celiac disease is associated with uh, uh, enamel defects. Yes. So not only do you have weak enamel, you've got weak bones. Yeah. 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 So, so we do this workup and someone has osteoporosis. And on a traditional doctor, what do they give them? Uh, usually the bisphosphonates. Those are the, you know, like things Fosamax, like Fosamax, Actinel. Boniva, Actinel, those, those kinds of things. And the interesting thing about them is they have a not, not so good risk benefit uh, ratio. Yeah. Uh, you can get significant side effects. You can get osteonecrosis of the jaw. Uh, they're not to be used. They're to, not risk free. They're not risk free. And there's, inject not cheap. And there's injectable drugs. Also. Not, they do them injectable now. And, and also there's Forteo, which is like a parathyroid hormone uh, like drug. Yep. And sometimes uh, doctors even use drugs like Avista, which blocks estrogen uh, receptors. They're selective estrogen blockers. And of course, Doctors use hormones like estrogen therapy, although that comes with certain risks. Absolutely. And even in men, testosterone therapy. So these are all therapeutic options out there. But we take a different approach in functional medicine. So what would be an approach that we would focus on with osteoporosis that different? Where do you start with patients and how do you build up the treatment model for them? Well, I, the first thing I get people to do is to start using their bones, start using their muscles. So getting people to the gym, you know, doing some uh, resistance exercise at least three days a week uh, where you're really stressing the bones is going to be the biggest thing. Um, Optimizing their body. So strength training, strength weightlifting, training. bands, and also body weight exercise. Like the, you just really need to push your, your bones. And, and and at the same time, you're building the muscles. Yeah. And then you're also helping with balance. So it's not so much that when you fall, because you know everybody falls, okay, but you want to have the, the muscles and the reflex time to be able to catch yourself so that you don't necessarily break something. That's right. So right. Re really important to have the yeah. muscle mass and the uh the uh, um the it's true. Yeah. The yeah. core strengthening exercises are so important. People have just so low strength stability as they get older and they lose their balance and yeah that's an important point and then also optimizing vitamin d levels and we actually will do some uh genetics uh related to that and interestingly there are some gene variations uh related to the vitamin d receptors so people who have uh genetic variations of the vitamin d receptors need higher levels than quote unquote normal so if you look at the range of normal vitamin d uh yeah, the standard laboratory is about 30 to 100 and if you're at 32, your doctor will say, oh, you're fine. You have enough vitamin D. Well, guess what? If you have a problem with the polymorphisms related to the vitamin D receptor, you need to have that be on the higher end. You may need to be up to about 80 to 100 in order to have that uh, the, the beneficial effect. That's right. So we really focus on exercise and strength training, focus on vitamin D levels. We also do a lot with diet, right? Because you want to eliminate the bone dissolving things in your life and your lifestyle and your diet and you want to add the bone building things so what are the bone dissolving things we want to help people get rid of and we talked about it a little bit but yeah well, uh, well excess amounts of protein uh and also uh, if you have um uh, acidic urine you're you can actually be more uh, susceptible to uh, more or less peeing out your bones so um uh, uh decreasing uh, uh those things which then, is our processed diet will cause you to be more acidic you know? exactly and then the green leafy vegetables uh, are, are very good. Uh, and then, you know, things like sardines, which are great because they they have natural, uh, the, the sardines are one of my favorite foods because guess what? They got great protein, they have great omega-3s, and they have great calcium. And it's highly absorbable calcium. That's so right. if you want to actually help your bones, eat sardines. Yeah. Herring, sardines, mackerel. That's what yeah. I'm having for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having canned mackerel. With the, they get what, ones with the bones in them is yeah, even better. exactly. And that's how a lot of the populations who lived on islands would get their calcium. They'd eat the fish bones. Yeah. Yeah. So, so getting rid of things like alcohol, caffeine, excess salt, excess protein, uh, too much sugar, obviously all the sodas, the junk food, the food additives, that's so important. And then adding in all the foods that are going to build your bone, like the sardines or herring or mackerel, but also the, the greens. I mean, where, where do cows get their calcium from? <laughs> Grass. Grass. <laughs> right? So you can actually get more calcium, more absorbable calcium from things like tahini, which is sesame seeds. Sesame seeds, that's probably the highest source. Chia seeds have more uh, really? calcium per serving than uh, milk, <laughs> and it's better really? absorbed, okay. plus omega-3s and fiber. All the dark green leafy vegetables that you mentioned. The vitamin K is also in these green leafy vegetables. Yeah. So you, you, you omega-3 fats are really important, which you can get those from the sardines and the fatty fish. So a lot of foods that are bone-building foods. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. Alzheimer's may have very different causes. Uh, Dale Bredesen, we've had on the podcast, has talked a lot about the various causes, whether it's inflammatory triggers, mold, toxins, Lyme, blood sugar issues, insulin, the nutritional deficiencies, hormonal dysregulation.